Hello, and welcome to Talk the Walk. I'm Azam Khan. Hong Kong has invested heavily into creating the vehicle to be a thriving arts hub, from two new world-class museums to a string of arts and cultural events lined up by the government for this year. However, is there an over-dependency on public funds in the arts? With the city having a long history of philanthropy and investments from the private sector to addressing social issues, how can the city better leverage its private sector to enhance the foundations of the arts scene, including the appreciation of it. Joining me today to discuss the issue is Dorothy Chan, Head of Philanthropy and Advisory, Asia Pacific at HSBC. Ms. Chan, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Yeah, thank you, Assam, for the invitation. Um, when you look at the arts scene in Hong Kong from 10, 15 years ago, mm -hmm. how would you compare it to the outlook of now after the opening up of the two new, new museums to the string of um, cultural events that are being lined up by the government? Well, Assam, I have more gray hair than you do, so I think I can go further back and say, you know, our arts festival is celebrating 51st um, edition this year. So I think since the 1970s, the Hong Kong government has been a key champion of arts and culture in the city. Um, so from a very small city hall today, we have the cultural center, we have all these civic centers spread around town, plus the two major museums. And the museums didn't come overnight. Um, it was started planning in the 20 years ago. Um, so the government has always felt strongly about this field. And one of the things that I personally felt um, quite delighted to see is both museums themselves have received some public, um, private fund support mm -hmm. and also the public welcomed them you know, a lot. So I think the city is ready um, to have more cultural activities. Right, and obviously philanthropy does have a big history in the city and investments from the private sector. But how does that look when it comes to investment into the arts? Well, I'll be very frank and um, would say that compared to education and health, the arts are likely to be overlooked. Mm -hmm. But in, over the past few years, especially in light of COVID and poly awareness of the role of arts in terms of a mental health being, um, we've seen slightly more investment in that space, comparatively speaking. Um, so for instance, there's a number of groups using arts to help young people develop confidence, build their social network. And there's also um, groups that are using the arts to support the elderly or um, families who are going through a very tough time um, during, if a family member is sick, they can get together to use art to express their own emotions. Um, so we've seen arts being um, supported, but more in a very siloed or for, the, for very unique purposes. So what we're seeing now is that there's patronage of museums. Can you talk about the importance of that and the importance of investing into arts education basically? Does that help improve the appreciation of it? And you mentioned this one aspect of this charity that, um, that looks into uh, one way of its development. Mm -hmm. So what, uh, what are the other significance of it? I think um, art and education is quite a relatively new field, I have to say, and it's still sort of evolving. Um, the charities that I know was using this space uh, is trying to develop uh, young people's critical thinking. So we can take a look at a very historical painting, um, any Picassos or any Chinese painting, and think back um, and ask the young children to think about what do you think is taking place in the picture? Um, why are people dressed this way? If you have to make a costume out of it, how would it look like? What is the significance? So they're using the arts as a tool to teach both history and also encouraging young people to um, imagine, be creative. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that's like, we'd like to see these, I would say, softer form of right. education, um, just to encourage uh, our young people to you know, solve more problems and also understand our um, past and heritage a lot more. Right. Um, the city does invest a lot into higher education as well. So you think that there is an ability for them to also be able to invest into education in this? It'll be quite easy, right? Would you say so? Well, um, I'm not sure whether you know that, but the Hong Kong Academy of Performing Arts is ranked number 10 globally. Okay. So the top three schools are like, you know, the Juilliards, um, all the conservatories you and I have heard of, right. but we don't even know that we have such a great champion in Hong Kong. And in Asia, the APA is number one. Um, right. So we've always have a gem, and um, now it's time for them to really shine. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, we've seen a government uh, suggesting that um, they build and run and do that talent scheme in the Northern metropolis. Mm -hmm. So um, if 
there's a lot more need in terms of not just philanthropy, but also on talent development, in terms of financing, to um, realize that vision. How can Hong Kong become a hub for arts education or arts and cultural um, development for the Greater Bay Area? Aside from museums and the larger arts draw, mm -hmm. um, what are other ways the city can help better to develop its grassroots artist and art scene? Yeah, so I think that's, um, comes to some interesting places, like um, in, in terms of we have a lot of community centers these days um, that um, I would think as grassroots as something inside the MTR. Mm. Um, there's the community, um, remember there's little boxes where they're showcasing young people's work. Um, there's spaces for um, the living arts at, in Central Station where people can perform. And it would be great to, we, we can see more of that around the city because it brings, um, I would say go beyond busking, mm. but you can do all these lively um, events and let our everybody to release their creative um, energy. But of course, it has to be done in a organized manner. It's not just you and I can you know stick a mic and <laughs> start right. singing. So, so I, I think some some form of enabler or regulation would help um, in that sense. To first of all, you know, let's create these outlets for mm. um, individuals to perform and also appreciate each other, uh, what we have in the city. So that, that's one easy thing that we could do. Mm -hmm. And then um, another one is um, for philanthropists or um, anyone interested in embedding cultural appreciation of the arts amongst young people, there's a number of student um, sponsorship schemes um, so that you can buy um, tickets for students to join uh, for harmonic shows or the Hong Kong ballet shows. Um, they might not get it immediately, but um, Speaking from personal experience, I still remember being brought to see the cultural center when it first opened. Um, it, that shows how old I am. And, and looking into the seats and they were explaining how the um, concert hall has to be constructed for the maximum sound effect. Of course, for me at that time, I thought it was the most boring thing. Like, why is the school organizing this outing for us? But it, fast forward decades later, um, I, I enjoy the music like, quite a bit. I do support the Philharmonic quite a bit. And also, when I'm, every time when I'm sitting in, in my chair, I'm looking into, wow, this is the engineering that go into it. Um, so starting, um, we may not get it when we're young, but the dividends will pay off further down the road. Right, and Hong Kong is already a city that makes it difficult. That historically, it has a little bit of a difficulty for young artists to be able to fully thrive with the expensiveness of the city. And, culture, and culturally, it's something that's not um, encouraged by families later on. Um, so what you're talking about is building a community appreciation around the arts for the young people to be able to thrive and to give them a chance basically to enhance. Yeah, I think even just basic exposure, because um, we still have a, um, unfortunately in our city there's still a number of young people who has uh, fewer resources mm. and um, buying a concert ticket is an extravagance. Um, so being, giving them a chance to experience it is a first step to something that could be magical. Um, I remember I was interviewing some um, scholarship candidates uh, recently for one of our clients, and among all of them, they came up with very ingenious, um, I would say, careers that I never realized existed. Music supervision, um, being a composer for films. At the back of their minds, they are aware that such jobs exist, but they don't have the outlet or um, the reason they really need to go overseas to pursue this subject is because we don't have the ecosystem right. um, for them to pursue their career. So we also need to do some parts, like the other aspects, making sure that if they do succeed to become a composer for films, we have a system here, an ecosystem here where they can apply, whether it's for documentary making, cartoon right. making, or you know, major theater making, that they have jobs. Um, so we can have more people studying in this field. The work that you do right now in philanthropy, you know, with your current institute and in philanthropy, it gives you a, <clears throat> a finger on the pulse, on the societal pulses in different ways. Um, so you could just talk a little bit about the importance of community building when it comes to tackling issues in Hong Kong, um, which I imagine is something that you examine a lot or have seen a lot through your work, and which is also relevant when it comes to enhancing the arts scene over here. Yeah, that has been a huge topic, especially um, what, after what we've experienced during COVID. I've seen a lot more philanthropists and also um, young people interested in the social sector wanting to do more community building work. So um, for, well, I'll probably cite an example when it comes to for what philanthropists has been doing. They noticed that um, 
when we were growing up, we always know our neighbors, or we could be screaming, you know, at each other at the estate, say, you know, come home, your know, mom is looking for you, type of thing. Um, but we lost that neighborly touch. Like, I, I don't know how often you see your neighbors and say hi. I know their names. or get invited over to the house. Um, but that kind of spirit sort of have um, dwindled in the past few years, or actually over time um, in, in Hong Kong. So I've, I've, there's like a bunch of donors, like easily can think of on top of my head, at least 15, 18 families who gathered together to try to rebuild that spirit. Having, um, for instance, we're in Central now, um, but they wanna make sure that as time you live in Central, um, the people in Central will know you, will ask about you. Right. Um, and so they've been making vouchers available so that um, when the, um, during COVID, this, this has happened during COVID and they're continuing to do this, I have to um, emphasize that. Um, the mom and pop shops will accept those vouchers, which is given by the family, and then um, they get to develop the bond. So they will see, Sam, you're coming here today, how are you, where is your children? Um, just having that neighborly chatter. And then they might hear about other jobs, like it could be off jobs in the neighborhood and say, oh, you know, the store down the road uh, needs somebody to on the stocking. So mm -hmm. can you help out, you know, if you want to try out? Um, so I've seen um, philanthropists trying to come up with different programs, delivering food, et cetera, just to make sure that neighbors know each other. And then on the other hand, I've seen young people who decide to go into districts and say, I want to revitalize this area. Um, let me look into what are their strengths. So um, I met a group in Lantau recently, and they looked at all the farmland and were so impressed about it that they were like, hmm, mm. um, let's revitalize farming. Let's make sure that the products are delivered within a certain vicinity. And let's also make sure that in addition to farms, um, the handicrafts are also uh, have a channel to be sold. Right. Um, so we see that quite a bit. Ms. Chan, I'm going to pause you right there while we take a quick break. Uh, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with Dorothy Chan. Stay tuned. Welcome back. I'm here speaking with Dorothy Chan. You were mentioning before the loss of community building mm -hmm. um, that's been brought about the last few years. And I think digitalization has also added to that. And obviously the pandemic with everybody um, locked up and cooped up. But could you talk about the increasing uh, impact of digitalization into the philanthropic world and that, that dynamic? I personally think there's still a lot of opportunities which are untapped in this space. We have um, we've heard about, about more about blockchain for past few years or almost a decade now. And if, when blockchain is being applied, it actually could um, enhance transparency and also make all the donations more transparent. Um, obviously, when it comes to philanthropy, a lot of people just thought, why, why do I need to invest in the infrastructure? So with that, it's sort of a, we're sort of in a chicken and egg situation, right? Um, if we don't build the platforms that enable the use of blockchain um, for good, we're never going to have that. So we're in desperate need for a bold philanthropist to put money in there to make this happen. So that's just one example of how technology could be applied to build communities. Um, but I think increasingly we've also seen how a number of NGOs are using gamification to um, help young people connect with each other. We know that um, young people tend to be more comfortable using technology on WhatsApp, et cetera. And there's a number of um, NGOs that have used those tools to um, provide mental health services. So everything from big data to analyze whether there is a potential um, suicide ideation words um, to actually just checking in to see how are you doing. Right. Um, that's kind of work. So the innovation is here and I still feel like, you know, there's, we need a lot more funding to go into this space right. for us to build communities at that level. Well, if you're looking for funding, um, would you say that Hong Kong has uh, uh, the right environment for that, being a financial hub, being a big business community? Um, and just to uh, add to that question, um, do you think Hong Kong has a chance to be a um, philanthropic hub for Asia, for other Asian countries to be able to um, model after, mm -hmm. um, especially given its history in philanthropy, um, the number of uh, very well-known philanthropists over here, and just its connectivity to the rest of the world. Um, do you think Hong Kong has a chance to be able to spearhead that? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would take your 
second part of the question sure, first sure, yeah. about Hong Kong's potential as a philanthropy hub um, in Asia. So personally, we have a lot of strengths. Um, we have a number of families here who has transitioned their wealth. And when it comes to philanthropy, it's not just about writing a check. They've also been using philanthropy as a tool um, to educate the next generation. In fact, in a survey that um, HSBC trustee conducted um, last year, we see that one third of um, Greater China um, clients are actually more actively using philanthropy to do that. As a, um, as, as a way of assessing, you know, are the next gen ready to enter the family business? And, and also, um, are they getting understanding the family values? Because as we know, reputation matters a lot. Um, and that's a very high number compared to what we see in, the, in that survey compared to the US or the rest of the world, mm -hmm. that where it's only 9% or so. Mm -hmm. so. So we see that there's a unique Asian characteristic when it comes to philanthropy. It's the inter, um, integration of family values and also in doing good. Mm. So we have this experience for um, that I think a number of other countries may not yet have developed. And then the other aspect you mentioned, the financial hub, that's another strength that we have. You know, it's a free flow of capital in and out as long as the receiving party welcomes that. So we also have that of a strength. Um, we have a lot of wealth in it um, here and there's hopefully more coming um, from all around the world. Um, so we, we have all of this positioned. Where we need, and I think um, it's not just in the philanthropic space, but also just um, bigger in Hong Kong, is the talent. Right. Um, being able to speak to clients, um, not just about um, their financial investment, because a lot of times uh, some of our clients um, are moving a lot farther ahead than um, some of the advices might be. Right. So um, for instance, um, there's, there's a family office in Hong Kong which is very well known in using the total portfolio approach in terms of their investments. Um, and they count community investments as one of the ways they invest. So is their financial investment, um, they only invest in things that are green and sustainable. Um, they will do impact investment along those lines. They will put money in social enterprise and also when it comes to philanthropy and they see this is the way I'm going to make change. Right. Well, you already touched on this in your answer, but um, where does the increasing importance of ESG tie into this um, and Hong Kong's outlook um, with its philanthropic landscape uh, with ESG involved? Well, it, the government is very keen on pushing a lot um, bigger an ESG investment in Hong Kong. So that's already um, helped us quite a bit. I think if we look into the inflows of uh, funds into the space globally, it has increased substantially in Asia. Um, but there are also other opportunities that we have not tapped. I, pers I feel that um, there's something called blended finance. Mm -hmm. The World Economic Forum um, earlier this in January put together this a big portfolio um, that brings together philanthropic capital, private capital, and government capital mm -hmm. to tackle climate change right. and other gl um, big global issues. Yeah. So Hong Kong has all three elements. Why don't we do that? Um, it could be on climate, it could be on our housing challenge. Um, we can all, you know, there's innovation that we can be doing. And also social impact bonds. That's another area that um, I think we had the idea of doing, um, but we haven't quite found a very successful showcase. So I think it's one of those things like, once we have a successful pilot, mm. we can replicate. Right. Um, so those are opportunities that I think Hong Kong can tap into um, to so further solidify its space. That's true. At the uh, Climate Summit COP27, there was a lot of emphasis on blended finance mm -hmm. and um, that sort of direction to be able to um, fund and tackle the issues. But then how, do, how does that line get straddled? Um, is then, there, then you rely more on the will and the conviction of the private sector. So how do you straddle that line um, with philanthropy and um, involving the public sector and uh, making sure their responsibility is also added to it. So how does that balance get created? Well, I think in the end, um, we need very strong governance structure mm. to make these things happen. Um, it, it's accountability because uh, it involves public money. Mm. Um, I think philanthropy, a lot of philanthropists sort of say, I would like to see 
my funds being what go towards a, an accountable way. Um, and, and the cohesion between all three, right? Between the yeah. NGOs and the private and the public sector and the synergy between all yeah, three. Yeah, precisely. Um, so you know the subject very well. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and also for, for all three to be aligned. Right. So you need to have a common vision and common objective, mm. and then you put those funds together. And all the capital plays very different role. Um, the philanthropic, um, the philanthropic funds is really just to de-risk it so that projects that is very solid and sound at the core receive funding, which um, otherwise the, on a commercial basis would not happen. Um, mm. So you see that quite a bit, uh, for instance, in some developing economies when they want to put in renewable energy projects. Mm. It's a fantastic project. It makes sense anywhere. But perhaps because the electricity cost is too low, um, a bank or other commercial entity don't, wants to fund it. Because right. um, it will impact their return. But then if you put in a bit of um, philanthropic funds, um, it will make it um, reasonable. Sure. Yeah. I'm curious, how did the pandemic in the last couple of years and the, the struggle that um, every sector and everybody went through, how did that affect um, your work and the landscape generally for philanthropy? I think um, Hong Kong has always had a bigger share of international giving. and and, I, and when COVID happened or during the pandemic, we see that a number of our clients decided, oh my God, you know, Hong Kong also needs help. Private donations. Yeah, private from donations. Individuals. Yeah, mm -hmm. from individuals. Because mm -hmm. I, I think if you, I mean, Hong Kong is known for giving to the mainland and there's um, ad hoc giving here and there to the US and educational institution. Mm -hmm. So um, the pandemic was a wake up call because um, everything became very Throwing apparent. Into disarray and prior. Uh, yeah, the, the, all the needs become, everybody became a lot more aware. Besides, um, we're, we have nowhere to go. Um, and, and so we're reading the news, we're walking the streets, we see what a lot of people are going through, the hard, hardships. So, um, so we've seen a lot more clients um, making, being more interested in community level uh, projects that they right. could invest in Hong Kong to help us rebuild. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, I just also wanted to get your, um, your take on with International Women's Day around the corner, mm -hmm. um, just to take a little bit of segue on this. I apologize about that. But how do you see the role of women in philanthropy today um, impacting and changing um, the sector? Yeah, I think women are mostly very humble about the work they do. <laughs> they're always drawing up you the sleeves. Case in point over here. <laughs> <laughs> Being very kind. Um, they're always drawing up their sleeves mm -hmm. and doing things. And, Every time they get involved, it's not just themselves. It's their families, it's their friends. So, um, and a lot of them are just doers. Like if you look around the NGO landscape in Hong Kong, especially in the small and medium-sized ones, um, I bet you nearly 80% of them are founded by women because they are walking around the streets seeing what's happening. Um, or they have, more, um, they have more interaction on a daily level um, with children or communities, they see that these are areas we can help address the needs. So a number of clients just decide that I'm going to start my own NGO and I'm going to do it and address a need. Um, so I think women has been a silent um, change maker. I believe that's all the time we have. Dorothy Chan, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Yeah, thank you, Asam. That's all we have for now. I'll see you same time next week. Goodbye.